The battlefields of the sea bear, of course, no physical trace of the events that transpired in those places. Wind and water wiped the debris from the surface in a few days, even hours, and the depths engulfed the ships and the men that fell victim to the action. Sir John Keegan, The Price of Admiralty. As Skipper Waldron led his squadron of TVD devastators on the final attack against the enemy aircraft carrier, his luck ran out. One of the defending Zeros must have hit fuel lines, for the leaking fuel and the hundred knot wind created a searing blowtorch in the cockpit. This was the end. He could no longer estimate his altitude, and he couldn't wait to ditch. No thinking was needed. The only way to avoid the unbearable heat was to get out of the aircraft. A free fall into the water was a less immediate threat. Unstrapping from his seat, unable to check on his gunner, Chief Dobbs, he started to step out of the fiery cockpit. Then it was over. The plane hit the water at 100 knots, and the skipper was thrown into the water as the plane broke apart. The fire was mercifully out, and the skipper's life and his fight were over. The remaining torpedo bombers flew past him as they pressed the attack, just as he had trained them. It had been a great sacrifice, and the day would have many sacrifices, but was it worth it? It was June 1942, less than six months following the crushing Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Admiral Nimitz had been told, hold what you've got and hit them when you can. The Battle of Coral Sea had taken place a month earlier and was the first battle in which the combatant ships had never seen or engaged each other directly. Rather, the lethal blows had been struck by their aircraft. Now, U.S. forces were finally in place to make their own devastating attack on Kido Butai, the Japanese Mobile Striking Force, a group of aircraft carriers approaching the island of Midway. Through shrewd intelligence work and Nimitz's willingness to make a prudent roll of the dice on the basis of calculated risk, three U.S. aircraft carriers and their battle groups were positioned northeast of Midway Island and were prepared to strike Kido Butai once it was found. The ensuing Battle of Midway has been called the turning point of the war in the Pacific. It was a crushing defeat for the Japanese, who lost over 3,000 men and four aircraft carriers of Kido Butai, all Pearl Harbor veterans. But the American victory at Midway did not come without cost. The carrier Yorktown and the destroyer Hammond were lost, 150 aircraft were lost, and 307 men were killed or went missing. Out of the epic struggle, this story focuses on just one group, the TBD Devastator Torpedo Bomber Squadrons embarked on the carriers Hornet, Enterprise, and Yorktown. By the end of the battle, most of the Devastator aircrew would be dead. A few would make it back to their carriers. Some would be forced to ditch in the open ocean due to battle damage or fuel starvation, and one pilot would face a worse fate, capture, torture, then death by the Japanese. This is the story of the Devastators. Attacking a hostile capital ship by air was done with two offensive elements, dive bombers, squadrons designated VB or VS, and torpedo bombers, squadrons designated with VT. Both were protected by fighter squadrons designated VF. Under best circumstances, the attacks were delivered simultaneously. Because of aircraft and weapons limitations, torpedo bomber attacks consisted of long, slow, low altitude approaches with little maneuvering, ending with weapons release within a half mile of the target. This slow and straight approach made the TBD devastators excellent targets for enemy fighters and ship-based defenses. Despite these drawbacks, torpedo bombers were an important part of the attack, even if hazardous to the aircrew and with low probability of hit. The reason why was the catastrophic damage a torpedo hit would cause. In the words of Lars Seelander in How Carriers Fought, few ships that sank did so without the help of torpedoes. Under the best conditions, torpedo bombers would meet the target ship head-on break into two divisions and attack from the port and starboard sides simultaneously. This hammer and anvil attack gave the targeted ship no good choice to maneuver away from inbound torpedoes. 
Yet, in real life, targeted ships were not so compliant to the intent of their pursuers, and with minimal warning, would turn to put their stern on the attackers, forcing the attackers into a chase in which the aircraft's modest speed advantage was substantially reduced, making the endgame attack more complicated as the torpedo bombers not only had to overhaul their target, but get ahead and then turn back towards the bow for the hammer and the anvil attack. The three Devastator squadrons were led by proven naval aviators, all Naval Academy graduates. BT-8 on USS Hornet was led by Lieutenant Commander John Waldron. BT-6 on USS Enterprise was led by Lieutenant Commander Eugene Lindsay. And BT-3 on Yorktown was led by Lieutenant Commander Lance Massey. Waldron was 41 years old, born in 1900, nearly three years before the Wright brothers had their first flight. A native of South Dakotan, his ancestry included two great-grandparents of Sioux Indian heritage, a fact of which he was quite proud. He had served in fighter and patrol squadrons previously. As a commanding officer, he was both a demanding boss and a demanding subordinate. Shortly after he took command of VT-8, one of his pilots had a fatal mishap. Immediately after the mishap, Waldron went to D.C. to confront his superiors on the need for better aircraft. It would not be the last time he confronted his superiors on fundamental issues. He was zealous in training his crews to the limits of their ability. Early on, he told the pilots of a newly formed squadron that he would drive them hard and that, before we are done here, we're going to know all we can know about the airplane and tactics. You are going to wish every airplane was in hell and that I was down there with them. Lieutenant Commander Lindsay graduated from the Naval Academy in 1927. Assigned to command VT-6, part of the Enterprise Air Group, he had already been awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross for his leadership in attacks at Kowajalin and Woche Islands prior to the Battle of Midway. Lieutenant Commander Massey graduated from high school in three years and was accepted into the Naval Academy when just 16. Lem qualified as a naval aviator was later assigned as executive officer of VT-6, serving under Skipper Lindsay. Massey led the first U.S. airborne torpedo attack, sinking a Japanese transport, and was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross. He took command of VT-3 shortly before the Battle of Midway. In 1937, the Navy, which still flew biplanes off its carriers, received its first TBD Devastator. Its mono-wing design, folding wings, and all-metal construction was a technological leap from existing carrier aircraft. Although it could carry a crew of three, for torpedo attacks, the crew was usually just the pilot and the gunner radioman. An early evaluation of the aircraft stated, The TBD-1 was found to be superior in performance to any horizontal bomber or torpedo plane in use by the Navy, has excellent flying characteristics, and is considered to be entirely suitable for operation from aircraft carriers or from a flying field. This was the torpedo bomber that would be flown off all three U.S. carriers at the Battle of Midway. The primary weapon carried by the Devastator was the notoriously unreliable Mark 13 torpedo that required his pilot to fly a slow, low, non-maneuvering attack that made the aircraft highly vulnerable. If the torpedo bomber crew survived to deliver the weapon as required, it was still an open question if the weapon would function correctly. Then, even if the weapon function is designed, some of the target ships could literally outrun the slow weapon. Yet, beyond the challenges of the Mark 13 torpedo itself, the Devastator, when carrying a torpedo at low altitude, could barely break 100 knots. That speed would, in the end, be the fatal flaw of the Devastator in combat. Not only was the Devastator slow and vulnerable to fly when armed with a torpedo, it was a menace every time it came to landing on the ship. An experienced Devastator pilot, recounting the comments of a landing signal officer, said, One thing I'll not forget was the TVD had a sneaky stall. The LSO could seldom detect if a pilot very slowly eased his throttle back. When this happened near the ramp, a bit of turbulence was enough to start the TBD into a level sinking stall. The engine lacked the power to save it. This would often lead to a ramp strike, that is, crashing into the rear of the ship, 
potentially killing the entire Devastator crew. Devastator pilots and gunners were no strangers to death and accidents. By the time hostilities commenced with Japan in December 1941, 30 of the 130 Devastators produced had already been lost to mishaps common in naval aviation at that time, to include mid-air collisions, ramp strikes, inadvertent wing folds on takeoff, barrier crashes, ditching at sea, engine failures, running out of fuel, ground collisions, and other causes. The U.S. was not the only country upgrading its naval aviation inventory. In October 1937, the year the U.S. received its first Devastator, Japan's government released its requirements for the aircraft that would develop into the lethal A6M-2A Zero Fighter. Its top speed was 331 knots, over three times that of a torpedo-laden Devastator. In a strange turn of fate, on June 4, 1942, the date that was also to see the epic Battle of Midway, a lesser-known engagement was taking place on isolated Alaskan islands. Petty Officer First Class Todiyoshi Koga, while conducting a combat mission, crashed on Akutan Island. Koga died in the mishap, but his Zero Fighter was left in surprisingly good condition. His unit was under orders to destroy any Zero that crash-landed, but his fellow aviators thought he might be alive, so they didn't destroy the aircraft. On July 10th, the plane was discovered by U.S. forces. It was the first Zero fighter to be recovered in a condition to be made flyable. After being repaired and then fully tested by U.S. pilots, a classified report gave guidelines on how to avoid getting shot down by Zero. Its first two key points were, number one, never attempt to dogfight the Zero. Two, never maneuver with the Zero at speeds under 300 miles per hour. These specific test-based findings were not yet available to the Devastator crews at the Battle of Midway, but they already knew well enough to be wary of the Zero. An Enterprise Action Combat report from early 1942 stated, fighter protection for VT is mandatory. In an April brief to Torpedo Squadron Air Crew, they were told that in a 15 aircraft Devastator attack, it was expected that only three would make it through to launch their torpedoes. With intelligence that Kido Butai, the Japanese mobile striking force, was headed toward Midway Island, Nimitz's staff completed a succinct yet insightful estimate of the situation. In it, one of the Japanese strengths was listed as possible carrier VF superiority and stated, their fighters outperform ours, and we can no longer underestimate their naval air efficiency. But the estimate was not pessimistic. It laid out many of the strengths and advantages the U.S. had and commented, Our men are just as brave, and those who have been properly trained are believed to be better than their opposite Jap number. The carrier's Hornet and Enterprise got underway from Pearl Harbor on May 28th. Shortly after getting underway, the Air Group aircraft left their temporary land bases to land on the carriers. As Unsley made his approach on Enterprise, his Devastator departed flight, he crashed into the ship, and then the aircraft fell into the ocean. USS Monaghan, the plane guard destroyer, promptly picked up Lindsay and his two crew members, and later highlined them over to the Enterprise while the ships continued underway. Lindsay was badly injured, believed to have broken his back, and was confined to the sick bay. Yorktown did not get underway with the other carriers. Having just returned on May 27th to Pearl Harbor from the Battle of Coral Sea, it was estimated she needed 90 days to repair battle damage, but there was not time. She was given three days. With the repair crews working around the clock, anything that could help was provided, even to the local power company, allowing a series of rolling blackouts in neighboring Honolulu so the repair facility would have all the electrical power required. The patched up Yorktown got underway on May 30th. Once joined up, the Hornet Enterprise in Yorktown along with their escorts, proceeded to an area 350 miles northeast of Midway as they awaited the Japanese. On May 31st, with the distance closing between the two opposing maritime juggernauts, an intelligence and planning meeting was called for on Hornet. It started with Lieutenant Steve Jerica, the senior intelligence officer on Hornet, giving a brief on what would be expected from the Japanese. 
Kidu Butai would be in striking range of Midway as early as June 3rd. When Jerika was done, the Hornet Air Group leader, Commander Stanhope Cotton Ring, gave his plan to attack the Japanese. The differences between Ring and his subordinate Waldron were distinct. Both were graduates of the Naval Academy and both were pilots, but that is where the similarities stopped. Ring grew up in New England and was the son of a Navy Commodore. Waldron was the son of a Western rancher, and his mother was of Native American ancestry. He never saw the ocean until he arrived at Annapolis. Ring graduated from Annapolis a year before Waldron, was trained as a pilot, and in a demonstration of his personal courage, returned to aviation shortly after a fiery 1932 mishap, which impelled him to bail out of his aircraft and left him with burn scars for a lifetime. His tours of prestigious duty, such as being naval aide to President Hoover and assistant naval attaché in London, did keep him out of the cockpit at times. Waldron, on the other hand, was continually serving as a pilot, or at least in a role that included flying, and the one tour that was not directly a flying tour at the Naval Academy had him in an aviation-related billet. When it came time to perform in combat and to serve as a leader, it would become clear that Waldron, the subordinate to Ring, was the superior aviator and superior combat leader. Ring laid out his plan. It was one that was contrary to what had worked a month earlier at the Battle of Coral Sea. His plan was to have the entire fighter force with himself and the dive bombers at 20,000 feet. The slow and vulnerable torpedo bombers, nearly two and a half miles below the dive bombers, would have no direct fighter escort. Waldron knew this was a bad plan and said so, but Ring kept to his plan. The conflict wasn't over. On June 2nd, Waldron laid out his final tactical guidance to his crews. He explained why they would not get fighter support and that they would have to go in alone. He told them, You pilots and you gunners, be prepared to shoot it out with the Japs. We have a sound defensive doctrine, and you have 30 machine guns. We'll be low down to the water. They can't get under and shoot you in the belly. It's believed we can knock them down. One final comment was a sober and insightful prediction of the upcoming battle. Waldron continued, Apparently, most of the Jap fighters in the Coral Sea action went after VB and VS and allowed our VT to get in and sink a carrier. Be prepared this time for all of their VF to jump on VT. The Hornet, home to Ring and Waldron, was not the only carrier where discussions were taking place on how to best use fighters to protect the strike aircraft. On the evening of June 3rd on Yorktown, Lieutenant Commander Jimmy Thatch, the CEO of Yorktown's fighter squadron, VF-3, was working out the best way to support the coming strike. He spoke with the leaders of the dive bombers as well as Skipper Massey of VT-3. In a display of selflessness, each of the squadron CEOs said that the limited fighter coverage should go to the other group. Thatch figured that, due to the success of the torpedo squadrons in the Coral Sea action, the Zeros would be focused on countering the U.S. torpedo squadrons this time around, so we figured that is where the fighters should be as well. That same evening, sensing the approach of the battle, Waldron gave his junior crew of aviators one last dose of insight that they might need to increase their odds of accomplishing their mission and staying alive. He condensed his thoughts into a single page, which he had copied for each of the crew members. Gathered in the ready room, they read, just a word to let you know how I feel we are all ready. We've had a very short time to train, and we have worked under the most severe difficulties, but we have truly done the best humanly possible. I actually believe that under these conditions, we are the best in the world. My greatest hope is that we encounter a favorable tactical situation, but if we don't, and worse comes to worst, I want each of us to do his utmost to destroy our enemies. If there is only one plane left, to make the final run in, I want that man to go in and get a hit. May God be with us all. Good luck, happy landings, and give him hell. Waldron's single-mindedness to hit the Japanese aircraft carriers was not mere aggressiveness. It was clear to anyone who did the analysis that aircraft carriers were potent weapons, but also highly prone to conflagrations, especially when aircraft loaded with gas and weapons were on the flight deck and hangar deck. In the words of some, Carriers were eggshells armed with hammers. The U.S. Navy had discovered through war games the imperative need to strike hostile carriers before they did the reverse. Historian David Rigby said of the war games, 
had also inculcated into the thinking of the Navy pilots ten years before the Battle of Midway that the first order of business in any naval battle was to find and destroy the enemy's aircraft carriers. The side that strikes first would be the side that wins. This understanding of the primacy of hitting first would drive Waldron's actions in the days ahead. The evening of June 3rd, many pilots and gunners were writing letters home, and they knew that they might be their last. Waldron's letter expressed his love for his wife, Adelaide, and their two daughters, his uncertainty about the outcome, but also his commitment to the upcoming fight. I love you and the children very dearly, and I long to be with you, but I could not be happy or sure at this time. My place is here with the fight. I could not be happy otherwise. I know you wish me luck, and I believe I will have it. You know, Adelaide, in this business of the torpedo attack, I acknowledge we must have a break. I believe that I have the experience and enough sue in me to profit by and recognize the break when it comes, and it will come. Well before the U.S. carriers had gotten underway from Pearl Harbor, Navy PBY search aircraft had been conducting long-range searches for the Japanese formations. Starting May 22nd, multiple PBYs were flying all-day missions out to a range of 700 miles. At 5.45 on June 4th, over two hours after American carriers had gone to general quarters, Midway-based PBY search aircraft located Japanese aircraft carriers 180 miles northwest of the island. The Japanese had already launched an airstrike that was inbound to Midway Island but the Japanese had apparently not yet detected the presence or location of the U.S. carriers. Within 30 minutes of the PBY contact report, Hornet ordered its pilots to man their aircraft, and squadron skippers were to climb up to the bridge for a one last word with Captain Mischler, the commanding officer of the ship, and the boss of Air Group Commander Ring. It must be acknowledged in this point in the story that Clausewitz's fog of war, and later, possibly a fog of memory, set in. There is historical controversy on what course the outbound air group took from Hornet. This story hues the belief that the strike group went nearly directly west, 265 degrees. But that's not critical. What matters is that in the end, the only part of the Hornet air group that found the enemy was the squadron led by Waldron. The first squadron skipper to the bridge was Pat Mitchell, commander of the Hornet fighter squadron. He made one last attempt to get fighter aircraft assigned to cover the Devastators, but again he was overruled. With that decided, Ring stated he would lead the Hornet Air Group out on a course of 265 degrees. Waldron, unwilling to accept a bad plan, argued that a course of 240 was more likely to find the Japanese carriers. But Mischer said they would follow Ring's course. The disagreement was not trivial. The two different courses would lead to two different areas, over 65 miles distant at the end of a 155-mile flight, enough to completely miss an entire hostile battle group. With the fateful decision made, the pilots manned their aircraft. At about 0700, Hornet and Enterprise started launches of their strike groups. The Hornet's air group launch was completed first, with Enterprise being delayed somewhat. Lieutenant Steve Jerica, although assigned to ship's company, was a qualified torpedo bomber pilot. Despite the odds against the Devastators, he suited up in his flight gear and was ready to take the place of any pilot who couldn't fly that day. Fortunate for him, he never got that chance. Once outbound, the Hornet Air Group proceeded on the 265 heading given by Ring. The last word was yet to be spoken regarding the right heading to take to find Kita Butai. Violating the order to remain silent on the radio, Waldron challenged Ring once more on the course. Ring was unmoved and told Waldron, I'm leading this formation, you fly on us. Minutes later, at about 8.25, Waldron replied with a curt, to hell with you, and turned left to the course he knew would lead them to the Japanese fleet. This decision was courageous and faithful. Waldron, strong-minded but no rebel, was violating the orders of the air group commander and the commanding officer of the ship. He believed they were both wrong. Ring and the rest of the air group, in what would later be termed the flight to nowhere, never did find the Japanese, but did lose 20 aircraft and 8 men dead because of running out of fuel. Had Waldron obeyed his orders, he would have been safer. He would have not been responsible for whatever happened, and he would not have run into the Japanese buzzsaw. 
Rather, knowing the absolute necessity of hitting the Japanese carriers as soon as possible with anything at all, he was bold. He assumed the responsibility for his actions and took the heading he knew would lead to the Japanese fleet, and his entire squadron followed him. Shortly after this, well north of Waldron, fighter aircraft from the Hornet Strike Group started to abandon Ring and turn back as they reached a point of no return with their diminishing fuel. At about 9.18, Waldron spotted Kitabutai. Waldron's navigation had been perfect. His flight came head-to-head -head with the lead Japanese carriers. He broadcast his find on the radio, and although it was heard by some pilots in Ring's strike group, Ring did not respond and still maintained his westerly course. Descending to just 500 feet over the waves and going into their attack phase, Waldron took his division to the left, and acting XO, Lieutenant Jimmy Owens, took his division to the right. Shortly after spotting the Japanese ships, VTH devastators were caught in a tidal wave of Zero fighters, about 27 in number. The targeted Japanese ships turned west, putting their sterns to the attackers, which reduced the devastators' rate of closure to 70 knots. This made their deadly running of the Gauntlet of Zeros even more prolonged and agonizing, lasting perhaps as long as 15 minutes, excruciating minutes and seconds as pilots and gunners saw their friends go down as they tried to fend off the Zeros' attacks. The pressure was so great, those aircraft of the two divisions that were still airborne collapsed back into a single formation for self-defense. Waldron continued to lead his men in, making radio calls in case others might be able to monitor them. Then, alone in the van, except for attacking Zeros, the skipper's plane burst into flames which engulfed the fuselage. Waldron was seen trying to climb out of the flaming aircraft cockpit as the aircraft descended and hit the water. His fight was over. At the very end of the run, 12 Devastators had already been shot down. As the remaining three struggled to reach their weapons delivery point, two more were shot down, leaving one remaining damaged Devastator to deliver its torpedo. This Devastator, piloted by Ensign George Gay, whose rear seat gunner Bob Huntington was likely already dead, approached the Kaga from his port side. Gay, already wounded and his aircraft badly damaged, made his weapons release at 800 yards. And maneuvering to egress the area, he ran into a flight of five zeros and was finally shot down. Amazingly, Gay survived the water entry and proceeded to have a front seat view of much of the rest of the battle, before being rescued by a PBY the next day. He was the only survivor of the 30 VT-8 aircrew that had launched from the Hornet that morning. Meanwhile, at 9.40, probably 5 to 10 minutes after the last VT-8 Devastator had gone into the Pacific, Ring was about to lose the last aircraft that continued to follow him. As Ring droned west into the barren waste of the Pacific, not hearing radio calls that others did, and having lost the vote of confidence in his leadership, as three of the four Hornet Air Group squadrons had decided to stop following, the remaining squadron was about to depart as well. Lieutenant Commander Walt Rohde, skipper of VS-8, faced the inevitable that they had not found the enemy and that they were likely well past the point of being able to get all the way back to their ship. He led his squadron in a turn back to Hornet, as Ring now continued to fly west alone. As the conflict and drama had been playing out on the Hornet before they started their launch, Enterprise was preparing for launch as well. After almost a week of recuperation from his ramp strike, Skipper Lindsay was still so bruised about the phase that he could not put on his flight goggles. When asked by the Air Group Commander Wade McCluskey if he could fly, Lindsay answered, This is what I've been trained to do. The Enterprise Air Group had a similar fighter plan as the Hornet Air Group. All the fighters in the strike group would be up high, supposedly only a radio call away, but in reality miles distant, potentially out of sight, with an unreliable communications link. With the need to strike the Japanese fleet before they could launch a strike against U.S. Naval units, the airborne Enterprise dive bombers were directed to proceed to the target. Other strike elements still on deck would follow as they launched. Around this time, U.S. radio intelligence picked up the expected Japanese targeting report. The Americans could now expect the Japanese to launch a strike as soon as possible on the American aircraft carriers. At nearly the same time as Ensign George Gay was lining his aircraft up on his target, the Enterprise Devastator Squadron, Lindsay's flight of 14 VT-6 Devastators, spotted smoke on the northwestern horizon. 
Turning toward the target Kaga, Lindsay took his division to the left, and his exo, Lieutenant Eli, took the remaining aircraft to the right. In reaction to having spotted the Devastators, Kidu Butai turned to put their attackers on their stern, just as they had done earlier with Waldron's VT-8. This would make VT-6's approach take that much longer and make it much more hazardous. Yet, initially, the situation looked hopeful for VT-6. Not that they knew the reason why, but the bulk of the Zeros protecting Kitabutai had surged east and northeast to deal with VT-8. Once the threat from VT-8 was neutralized, the picture for VT-6 would look considerably graver. This unhindered approach did not last for long. VT-6's right division was the closest to the hurriedly returning Zero fighters, and they were the first to be put into the same meat grinder that had chewed up VT-8. Only two of the seven Devastators in Eli's division survived to deliver their torpedoes, neither of which hit the target. Lindsay's division on the left was getting hit too, and he was heard calling for fighter support, but none came. Despite the opposition, it looked like Lindsay's division might reach the drop largely intact. Then, at the last minute, Kaga launched a flight of Zeros point-blank into Lindsay's remaining Devastators. The skipper was the first to be shot down, and although his division shot down one Zero, only three of Lindsay's Devastators got close enough to launch their torpedoes, none of which were hits. Out of ET-6's initial 14 aircraft, only five Devastators were left to attempt egress. In a final insult, after escaping the Zeros and navigating back to Enterprise, they had an unexpected challenge. One of Enterprise's fighters misidentified a returning VT-6 Devastator for a hostile and shot at it. Upon landing, one of the Devastator aircrew, still wearing a sidearm, made a visit to the fighter ready room to discuss the issue. Yorktown was the last aircraft carrier to start its launch, delayed because it had been recovering surveillance aircraft. Although the last to launch, the Yorktown, unlike Hornet and Enterprise, launched its strike group in a compact, well-sequenced group that maximized overall total fuel conservation for the air group. The slower devastators led the way, and the dive bombers and fighters caught up to form a complete package. Lem Massey served as the group's lead navigator. Yorktown, the only one of the three U.S. carriers to have been at the Battle of Coral Sea, composed their strike group differently than those of Hornet or Enterprise. Yorktown's air group had decided to provide dedicated fighter coverage for Lem Massey's VT-3 Devastators. VT-3 flew in at 2,500 feet, and when they would catch up, they would have a section of two attached fighters stepped up 500 feet behind them. The division of four fighters, led by the VF-3 skipper, Lieutenant Commander Jimmy Thatch, was 2,000 feet higher. Shortly after 10 o'clock, as the VT-6 survivors were trying to egress, the beginning of the end of Kidu Butai appeared. McCluskey, leading the Enterprise dive bombers to high altitude, and they had spotted a large group of Japanese ships. As McCluskey led his Enterprise dive bombers towards the Japanese formation, the final Devastator Squadron, Lem Massey's VT-3 from Yorktown, spotted their prey as well to their starboard. The Devastators turned toward their target, Hiryu, and descended. Their target, as other targeted Japanese carriers had done, turned away from the Devastators. To get Hiryu, Massey and his crews would have to fight their way through. VT-3's approach to the target would be a bitterly long trial, taking nearly 20 minutes for those who would survive. By now, there were about 40 Zeros airborne. As the other Devastator squadrons had done, VT-3 split into two divisions, Skipper Massey taking one and Lieutenant Hart the other. As the Zeros came head-on to the VT-3 aircraft, the Skipper's aircraft went down. Chief Aviation Pilot W.G. Esters assumed leadership of the Skipper's division. While five of Esters' division made it to torpedo drop within 800 yards of Hiryu, none of Hart's division got within weapons delivery range. Of the five Devastators that delivered their weapons, one crashed shortly after weapons delivery, a section of two aircraft egressed north and were never seen again, and the other two both damaged egress to the east. Although neither of the aircraft would make it back for a landing, they ditched close enough to the U.S. carriers for three of the four aircrew to survive. One of the pilots from VT-3 was to undergo a nightmare ordeal. 
and some Wesley Osmus, flying in Hart's division, had gone down during the strike, and was taken aboard the Japanese destroyer Arashi, where he was interrogated, tortured, and then murdered. As the last devastator attack of that day was playing out, the crescendo of the Battle of Midway was taking place. The dive bombers of Enterprise and Yorktown had found their targets, come in largely unopposed, and hit the carriers. Fighter pilot Jimmy Thatch, seeing the dive bomber attack take place, later said, Then I saw this glint in the sun. It looked like a beautiful silver waterfall. These were the dive bombers coming down. Kaga, Soryu, and Akagi were mortally hit and immediately combat ineffective. Kaga and Soryu would be scuttled that day and Akagi the next. The remaining lead member of Kidu Butai, the Hiryu, would survive the launch strikes which would severely damage Yorktown, who despite heroic damage control efforts would sink. Hiryu was struck in subsequent raids by Dauntless Dive Bombers and would join her Kidu Butai sisters at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. The Japanese cruiser Mukumi would join them shortly. In total, over 3,000 Japanese sailors and airmen would perish. The Americans suffered as well. The Yorktown, which seemed like a prize fighter that kept coming back, finally succumbed to the damage and sank, along with USS Hammond. 307 American sailors and airmen died. The loss rate for the VT squadrons was severe. Of the 41 devastators launched that morning, only four aircraft would land back aboard a carrier. Of 82 pilots and gunners that launched in the morning, only 14 survived, and six of those would spend up to two weeks adrift before being rescued. In Michael Shera's Pulitzer Prize winning The Killer Angels, Robert E. Lee speaks to General Longstreet shortly before going into the second day's battle. He says, We are never prepared for so many to die. So you understand, no one is. We expect some chosen few. We expect an occasional empty chair, a toast to dear departed comrades, victory celebrations for most of us, a hallowed death for a few. But the war goes on, and the men die. The price gets even higher. Some officers can pay no longer. We are prepared to lose some of us, but never all of us. Surely not all of us, but that is the trap. You can hold nothing back when you attack. You must commit yourself totally. And yet, if they all die, a man must ask himself, will it have been worth it? In the after-action reports following the battle, the torpedo squadrons were uniformly lauded for the determined aggressiveness and personal gallantry shown by those who made the attack. What was stated for VT-6 in the Enterprise after-action report would apply to all the VT squadrons. The attack delivered upon enemy carriers by the torpedo squadrons of our forces is believed to be without parallel for determined and courageous action in the face of overwhelming odds. These crews were observed to commence their attack against heavy anti-aircraft fire from the enemy carriers and supporting vessels while opposed by enemy Zero fighters in large numbers. The enemy fighter opposition was so strong and effective that 10 torpedo planes out of 14 of Torpedo Squadron 6 did not return. It is recommended that the Navy Cross be awarded to each pilot and gunner of Torpedo Squadron 6 who participated in this bold and heroic attack. But for the Devastator itself, and for use of any torpedo bomber, Admiral Nimitz clearly saw the lessons of the Battle of Midway. TBD planes are fatally inadequate for their purpose. The loss of the brave men who unhesitatingly went to their death in them is grievous. After the Battle of Midway, Devastators were no longer used in combat. Today there are no Devastators in flying condition, and there are no original ones in museums. The few Devastators to be found lay at peace on the ocean floor. In the aftermath of the overall Midway victory, but in light of the dramatic loss of the VT squadrons, difficult questions remain. What was the impact of the sacrifice of the Devastator squadrons? Some have stated that the attack of the Devastators, although not actually damaging the ships of Kidu Butai, did pull their Zero fighters out of position, so the dive bombers were able to come in unopposed and deliver their deadly blows. Others have discounted this notion, 
saying the real impact of the Devastators was to throw Kidu Butai off its timeline to organize and launch its own strike at the American carriers. Perhaps the bigger question is what was the meaning of the sacrifice of the men in the VT squadrons? Were the pilots and gunners fools for taking on a mission for which they rightfully knew their aircraft and weapons were less than adequate? What was the motivation of the squadron skippers to press on despite the known risk? One response is that in times of hazard and difficulty, there's always a reason to back out, to let someone else do the hard thing, to wait for the magic weapon, to delay for more training, to take care of oneself. But some moments of reckoning cannot be delayed, although such a delay might be in the best interest of an individual. In those moments, we hope for brave souls who will step up to the plate and play their role the best they can in the overall interest of the team. It is for their example that the crews of VT-8, 6, and 3 are worth considering so many years after their fight at Midway.